Jesus is coming back. And I thought, well, I knew about Christmas, I knew about <laughs> Easter. I had never heard that Jesus was coming wow. back. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. And to unpack, I mean, the Bible contains every single truth. It is our manual for living. And that's, again, why we called it Academy for Life. But people need to know how to apply it. Yes. Yeah, everything about you. And then they go, oh, so he can use me. I yes. said, yes. You're not going to be like a prophet in the Old <laughs> Testament, either bald or with a great long beard and wrinkles and all of that, and a man. <laughs> you are going to be an end times prophet. Yes. Because that's what God says. Um, hello, welcome today, everybody. Um, today we have Pastor Sheila Henley, um, the director of um, Academy for Life. And today she'll be sharing with us her experiences and uh, testimony how she came to know the Lord and how she works in the local communities today. Uh, so welcome, Pastor Sheila. And uh, it's good to have you here today. Would you like to share with us um, your experiences? Um, the first one being how you came to know the Lord and when you, when you came to know him. Well, thank you. It's great to be here with you today on this sunny day. Yes, I became a Christian when I was 18, which is a long, long time ago. I lived in London, and you can probably tell from my accent, <laughs> came up to Birmingham University in 1968, so that will also tell you my age. My parents were Quakers, which gave me a belief in God, but I didn't see Jesus as the Son of God, I just thought he was a great teacher. And so I came up to university with lots of questions, I'd been very heavily involved in the CND marches, which for the younger generation was the ban the bomb marches, <laughs> and I just couldn't get to grips with the fact that God had created planet Earth and it was going to be destroyed, we had the means to destroy it. Also in my second year at university, I moved out of the secure hall of residence into Handsworth, which was an inner city area of Birmingham, and worked on an adventure playground where I met children who didn't know who their dads were, who'd had a life where people hadn't really shown them a lot of love and a lot of respect. And I realised that my Quaker faith was totally inadequate for these situations. And so I had a series of questions and then one of my friends who'd been on drugs um, said, you know, I've invited Jesus into my heart. And it really sounded a bit funny to me, I have to admit. And I was like, oh, yes, how do you do that <laughs> yes, sort of bit yes. cynically? And she told me and I could see big changes in her life. So I went through a short period where I wanted what she'd got, but I was just too proud to ask for it. Yes. And then one night I was staying over and uh, she gave me this book called Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsay. And I started reading it and I got to about page 20 and it said, Jesus is coming back. And I thought, well, I knew about Christmas, I knew about <laughs> Easter. I had never heard that Jesus was coming wow. back. And I just felt this voice saying, are you ready? And I said, no, yes. I thought you were just a sort of doctrine, not a real person. <laughs> yes. And I remember crying, uh, cried a lot that night, which I guess were the tears of repentance. Yes. Yes. Um, looking back now, it was awful, but I remember saying to the Lord, well, I don't really know what sins I've committed because yes. hadn't, I hadn't done the usual ones that you think of. And straight away, the Holy Spirit showed me uh, the sin of pride, yes. sin of arrogance, wow. the sin of intellectualism. <laughs> and I thought, oh, right, OK. So they were all given to the Lord. So that was the night uh, that I gave my heart to the Lord. Oh, that's wonderful. So that's um, amazing how you've had that experience with the Lord. Yeah. And um, OK, well, do you like to briefly share with us um, the vision the Lord gave you concerning the ministry you have for the Lord? Yes, because at that time, I then asked the Lord, well, what, what do you want to do in my life? Um, he took me to America, where I stayed at Teen Challenge, which had been set up by David Wilkerson. And I wanted that sort of power in my life, because although I'd made a genuine commitment that night, I realised it was still... Sheila Henley asking God to bless my plans, not be me being totally open to God's plans. Yes. So it was when I was in America that I went forward. It was a meeting actually taken by Corrie Ten Boone, beautiful lady in her 80s at that time. And she talked about how we need the Holy Spirit, how without the Holy Spirit in our lives, we're like a glove without a hand in it. Yes. We're like a torch, you know, without the battery. And so I went forward that night, uh, got prayed for and, and filled with the Holy Spirit and came back and said, well, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I felt he said that he wanted me to live in Handsworth and work with the youth. Okay. And at the time, amongst the black community, was the whole Rasta thing was taking off, where they believed that their identity uh, was in Africa and with Haile Selassie. And so I started to do youth work on the streets of Handsworth. And I didn't think much about it at the time, but obviously God protected me. I didn't have a car. I used to walk back late at night after the youth club. 
and I got known, and I got known in Hansworth, and I'm sure you will laugh, uh, as the little white woman with the big gob. Oh. <laughs> and I said, well, you got it nearly right, but I'm actually the little white woman yes. with the big god. Yes, and this amen. big god is not confined to church buildings, and he cares about you. And of course, they would say back to me, oh, well, you're part of Babylon and all of this. And I realised, along with my growing contacts with the Sikh and the Muslim communities that had come and were making their home in the heart of this nation, in Birmingham, that actually we have presented a very westernised Jesus. Yes. And that's why there's not the power. Yes. Jesus yes. made an amazing claim when he said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. So what were we in our Western churches doing? We were lifting up a very narrow very cultural Jesus. Yes. So I started to read the holy books of the Sikhs and I realised there that there was this picture of Jesus, just as we had in Revelation, that one of, they call them the gurus, which is just the Punjabi word for teacher, mm -hmm. that one of their gurus would come back riding on a white horse mm -hmm. with a sword. And we, I knew that was Jesus. Yes. And so you could see that if we could change our language and get into the mindset oh, yes. of a young person brought up in a Muslim family, the Sikhs, they were looking for an identity over here. Yes, then yes. they would become Christians, but they would have their own cultural expression of that. Yes. It is no more holy to sit on a seat, as we do, than to sit on the floor. That's right. In fact, yeah. if we sat on the floor, we'd get more people in our churches. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> people feel more relaxed. And then God gave me an amazing opportunity with the city council uh, to become one of the community development officers. Okay. Because we're talking now in the late sort of 70s where the central government issued a programme called the Inner City Partnership. We've just sung, come walk with me round the walls of the city, see what the king has been building so well. And that's what we've invited you to do this lunchtime, to come with us, not physically over to Hansworth, but to come and to hear what the Lord is doing. Because if Hansworth Breakthrough is about anything, it's about Jesus. And it's about what he is doing in this city today. And it's also about what he wants to do, both in the inner city areas and in Birmingham as a whole and throughout this country. And that was a partnership that they wanted the local authority to have with community groups, whereby the community groups help their own communities. And I didn't think I'd get the job, probably my lack of faith, but it was, you know, it was a job at a high level. But I went for it. Obviously, I was the only officer that lived in the inner city and they gave me that job. And that was just an incredible opportunity. I worked with the black-led churches. One of the great challenges that uh, coming to the Christian church is the change within the Rastafarian movement, where mm -hmm. so many people are becoming disillusioned and are turning back for counsel for the Christian faith. And again, I think this is something that we can do, I mean, effectively, to gather to help them. I see a lot of Pastor Corbett of the Aston Shiloh Pentecostal Church because I'm a member of the management committee of the United Evangelical Project based here in Hansworth. And the main aim of the project is to meet the needs of the local community. Uh, they asked me to preach, so I went and I thought, right, OK, Lord, well, you give me the words to say. So I got known around the black-led churches, which led to a number of projects. We did our own record project, yeah, that's very which was great. <laughs> yeah, we got bookings in Zurich Cathedral <laughs> and in Frankfurt in Germany. It was absolutely great. <laughs> Not that I sang. Oh. I just fixed it up. I have no singing <laughs> yeah. voice whatsoever. Oh. But then, of course, the Muslim and the Sikh communities would come and say, we need a grant for this, we need a grant for that. So I would go and I would build up a dialogue with them. Mm, and I would say to the Sikhs, Oh, so you believe in reincarnation? Okay, so we mess up in this life, we come back then as a cat, so how can a cat be a good cat to ever progress back the other way? And they go, never thought about that before. <laughs> yes, yes. Similarly with the Muslims, I started to learn about the different groupings within Birmingham. We probably have, well at that time, we had about 80 mosques and Islamic centres, okay. but they're all different. They could never agree on when Eid was. And later on in one of my jobs, when I went into the education department, um, part of my role then was to visit some of the Islamic centres. And so I learned about the different groupings. And again, that gave me a great insight into Islamic teaching so that we can again put our Christian beliefs in the context of what they will understand. And I have a Quran in English, 
So I was able to compare the story that we have from the Bible with Adam and Eve with the story they have. And it starts off the same. And you think, am I reading the Bible or am I reading the Quran? <laughs> then suddenly it says, and the Lord came into the garden and forgave Adam. Yes. And you think, ah, that's why they don't understand the need for a saviour. Oh, okay. yeah. Because Adam was forgiven, yes. according to the Quran. Yes. So when you understand how the Quran has counterfeited the truth, it's easier to understand how we can have dialogue with the Muslim, our Muslim neighbours. Because yes. in Birmingham, a lot of Christians have Muslims as their neighbours. Yes. Well, that's wonderful that you're sharing your experiences and amongst the, the Sikhs and the Muslims mm. and sharing the love of God with them. Um, that gives me an understanding how the Lord's directed your paths and that's the, right. the Lord in your life and how you had the job as well. So, so that's um, really good to, that you share that today as well. Yeah. yeah thank you very much. And, not at all. And that was the background for this wider vision, because the, the Lord spoke to me very clearly from the writings of Paul. And he said, Sheila, when Paul, who does Paul address his letters to? So I'd say, well, he says, to the church in Ephesus, to the church in Corinth, to the church in Philippi. And then he addresses them to the saints. Okay. And gradually over time, the Lord showed me, yes, but... Where's the church in Birmingham? Yes. I said, oh, well, it's on this street corner, on that street corner. There's church, you've got a prophecy. There's the Methodist church. He said, precisely. I see my church as one. Yes. But it's not working as one. It's all sorts of denominations. And then you're having the growth of the house churches. You're having the growth of the vineyard movements as different giftings were being restored to the church. And so I became much more kingdom minded. Oh, yes. And actually, again, the Lord has been so gracious to me. I got a secondment from Birmingham City Council to do up the provision in the 12 constituency areas. Oh, okay. So cool. I said, yes, Beautiful. that's fine. I'll do all of that. <laughs> so, of course, I did all the church provision yeah. so that we could see how powerful we were oh, yes, if yes. we would work together. That's right. It's important. And so I would call meetings where I'd say to churches, I'm not asking you to come together on the unity of doctrine because we won't do that before yes. we're raptured, but just on the unity that you are operating in the same geographical area. Right. And we need to love the communities in which God has placed us. Right. And so we developed a trust called Birmingham Breakthrough, which say we'll break through in your local community. But then um, when we got to the year 2000, the Lord actually um, took me out of the local authority, where I was paid a very nice salary, and uh, placed me as one of the ministers in Birmingham Christian Centre, which was a miracle in itself, because that by denomination is Elim, and of yes. course I hadn't come up through the Elim denomination. And that was a large city centre church in Birmingham. And as I was doing the teaching programmes there, I realised that as Paul was writing to the saints, we needed to understand our identity. Mm, that's right. You see, it's that day that we made a commitment to Christ, that day when I made a commitment to Christ, that I was a sinner yes. saved by grace. Mm. But after that day, I became a saint. Yes. Am I perfect? No, of course <laughs> not. All my friends will tell you that. But actually, it's important, I started to understand, it's important that we take our identity from who we are in Christ, not from our background, not from our cultural group, not from our status or lack of it in society, but purely on the basis that we are now saints. Mm. Saints that will still mess up, but we have the power and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so part of the vision of Academy was to service, if you like, the church without walls and to service the saints at this time. Firstly, yes, yes. to get Christians to understand who we are in Christ. That's right. Everybody today is searching for an identity. So I'm sitting here talking to you. I can see Muslims walking past. I can see Sikhs. I can see young people dressed like punks. I can mm -hmm. see other young people dressed like goths yeah. because they're desperately saying, who am I? That's right. Who That's am right. I? And only Jesus Christ can answer that. That's right. And so the Academy for Life was born. The name was given because we want people to be victorious in this life as well as the life to come. Because a lot of Christians say, oh, well, it's going to be tough here, but I'll get right my reward in heaven. Mm -hmm. Actually, the moment we became a Christian, eternal life was put in us. Yes. That's what Christ gave us. Right. Obviously, that will be outworked in eternity, but we are planned to be overcomers in this life. Yes. And so I do, I work with different groups of people, with drug addicts, with just a whole range of people. In fact, a growing number of people yeah. that are coming out of witchcraft yeah. to say, when you find your true identity, these things will drop away. Right. 
So one of the courses we do do is a course on deliverance. Okay. But it's not like your usual course on deliverance, which tries to make people experts on demons. Mm. We're not called to be experts on demons. We're called to be focused on Christ, yes. the one who, after all, won the victory. Mm. And it's then working with people to apply that victory in their lives, in whatever, whatever areas they have given strongholds mm. to the enemy, who then has come in. Yes. and wants to possess their life. Yes. Jesus said, didn't he, I have come to undo the works of the evil one. Mm. And he will. That's right. And he has. We yeah. just have to learn how to cooperate with him. That's right. I think it's very important that people can understand who they are in Christ, our identity and their purpose That's right. in life as well. And, and uh, fulfilling their destiny, what are they here on this earth to do? Yeah. Like yourself, you're reaching out into the community and you're causing That's the right. church to come out of the walled building as well. That's yeah. right. And the other difference of the courses we do here is that I was realising the Lord was saying that he didn't want teaching courses that just made people go away better informed. What he wanted his saints to be is equipped. That's right. You know, many people, I've seen many people come to Christ and they're totally genuine, totally sincere. Their hearts are sincere, but their hearts are not wise. <laughs> and therefore, we do applied courses like how to learn to manage your money God's way, how to eat God's way. Yes, yes, yes. You know, because our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. We do courses on disbanding your strongholds. Okay. Yes. Because so many people say, oh, well, I'm possessed, just cast the spirits out. Now, I'll give you an example. I had one lady phone me up and say, um, will you come and deliver my son? Yeah. Now, I wondered whether she needed a midwife rather than <laughs> a minister. Yeah. But when we established it was a spiritual problem, I said, well, firstly, let's get this absolutely straight. I don't deliver anyone. Jesus does that. That's right. But what is the manifestation? Mm. She said, oh, he's got a spirit of laziness. So I said, oh, and, and how do you know that? How does it manifest itself? Yes, yes. So she says, uh, well, he doesn't get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> and I didn't say to her how I'm going to say it to you. Oh, yes. But basically, that is a parenting problem. Yes. Her son was yes. not possessed at all. <laughs> she just needed to put a few little disciplinary th yes. things in motion. Yes. And then... He would get out of bed all right. Was he a teenager? Uh, well, he was in his early 20s, actually. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. So a lot of that is dispelling the myths. Yeah, that's right. You know, I have people come to me saying, I've committed the cardinal sin, you know, and they're all dejected, as you would be, yes, thinking that yeah. that was it. You forfeited your place in heaven. And I say, OK. And they say, well, you don't seem very worried about it. I said, because I don't think you have, but you tell me what you think that sin is. Yeah, that's right. A lot of people will say, oh, well, I grew up in a church where they believe that if you're divorced, you can't get remarried. Yes. I said, OK, shall we just go to the Bible where Jesus talks about what the one, the mm -hmm. one yes. unpardonable sin is? Yes. So they read it. I said, OK. Well, my understanding of the language is that if that is Jesus saying that that is the only unpardonable sin, then... All the other things we do, they may not be desirable, but they are pardonable. Yes. Oh, yes, they go. So there you go. I think it's always important. You've set to, yourself free. Yeah, it's always important to bring people in perspective with the word of God, isn't it? And Absolutely. And discern what their issue is, if it's spiritual or if it's um, just purely just emotional. Like, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. And to unpack, I mean, the Bible contains every single truth. It is our manual for living. Yes. And that's, again, why we called it Academy for Life. But people need to know how to apply it. Mm. So there's a favourite verse, isn't there? Take every thought captive. Yes. And people say, oh, you need to take every thought <laughs> captive. And they go, a new Christian will go, well, I don't know quite how to do that. What do you mean? And if people have been church, they'll say, well, taking every thought captive means you take every thought captive. Yes. That's not actually very helpful for the person that says, yes, but I don't know how to do that. Yeah, yeah. And so we will apply that and say, right, this verse actually means, so we'll give you an example. I'm shopping in town and I hear a bomb go off. My first reaction is, that's a danger to me. So my thought will tell me my emotions, fear, this could hurt me, I'm going to run away. Yeah. Now, as a Christian, we take that initial thought captive, Bomb's gone off in the centre of town. This could be dangerous for me. I think I'd better run away. But I then say to the Lord, but I'm yours. Yes. You're in control That's of my life. That's right. No bomb's going to take me out until it's your timing. Mm -hmm. What do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. So I've taken the thought captive. I've taken it to Jesus. Yes. And he says, actually, 
I want you to run towards where you've heard that noise yeah. because I want you to pray with the people yes. that have been hurt. That's right, surrendering our fears as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And some, you know, for a new Christian, that feels very artificial to them. Mm -hmm. You know, they have a row, what do they do? They go back and drink, if yes. that's been an issue before they became a Christian. Mm -hmm. And you say to them, you are no longer an alcoholic. You are a Christian with an alcohol problem. Yes. Who is greater than your problem? Mm -hmm. Jesus. That's right. That's so right. it's realigning people's focus, but it's doing it in the wording that the world uses mm -hmm. instead of, you know, thus saith this and thou is this is. And the young people go, what? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's partly how we run our courses. Okay, that's wonderful. Also, um, it's interesting how the Word of God speaks about the last days and also tells you what's happening yes. in the future. And um, we, have a, we have a series of programmes coming up soon. Um, that you'll, we do? Yeah, that you'll be um, sharing some teachings with us. Would you like to um, briefly explain the teachings you'll be sharing with us on these programmes? Yes, yeah, certainly. And sometimes when people have been through our courses, they say, oh, how long did that take you to put it together? And they think, you know, they're expecting us to say six months or a year. And I say, well, 40 years. And they go, really? And I say, yes, because when I became a Christian at the age of 21, I didn't read the Gospels at first like most normal people do, or you're, you're told by a minister, well, start with the Gospels. I went straight to Revelation because I was fascinated to know where are we oh, in yes. God's calendar. Right. And so I've really traced all that for years and years, and I find it absolutely fascinating. But not with this fascination of, I want to know when he's coming back mm. because we're told we won't know the exact day right. or time. We are told that as Christians, we should be able to read the times and the seasons. But because I want to fully cooperate with the Lord in what he wants his people to do now. Mm, that's right. Because yeah. a lot of churches that, I mean, a lot of churches don't believe in the end times, but the churches that do are tending to focus their people on the rapture. But actually, the event that the Lord has promised is the greatest revival that has ever taken place on planet Earth will happen before we're taken out of the way. I don't worry about when I'm going to be taken out. Well, not taken out by the enemy. I mean, taken up, really. I mean, taken up. Uh, I want to make sure that I fulfil the destiny that God has for me while I'm here. And the end times revival, you started the tsunami of the Holy Spirit. It's gone into, well, it went to North Korea and they rejected it. South Korea, China, Indonesia. I was in Indonesia at the World Prayer Assembly two years ago, a totally Muslim country, and now 38% of the population are Christian. We have got no idea in the West that this amazing power is coming and it will sweep across this land. And I've said to the Lord, well, when? And he said to me, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. This was one of the first nations to receive Christ, you know, generations ago. But because we turned away from that, we turned our backs on our Christian heritage. He said, my spirit will come, but you will be after these nations, but it will come. But it will be short-lived in time-wise. And so to me, Academy for Life is like the storehouses that God gave Joseph the vision to build because God had said, there will be seven years of famine in Egypt, and that is irreversible. But with my God-given strategy, not only did Egypt get through it, it made her more powerful yes. than she was before the famine. And in this land today, and in right across Western society, there is a famine for the Word of God oh, yeah. and the power of God. Mm -hmm. So Academy for Life is like a storehouse, and we encourage churches. No, you haven't got 500 people knocking on your door today, but you will have. Are you ready? That's right. And our, our verse for Academy for Life is Acts 2, verse 17, when God said, I will pour out of my spirit in a new way mm. on men and women, on young and yes. old. In other words, every believer. You know, mm. I respect those that have the office of prophet. Mm. But as Christians living in the end times, it is our God-given inheritance that we will all prophesy. Mm. That's right. As that chorus says, I am a friend of God. Why? Because he chose me to be his friend, not because I'm arrogant enough to go around saying, yeah. oh, I'm a friend of God. He says, you know, I've made you a friend. Yes, yes. And friends share secrets. Yes. And God is sharing his secrets. Yes. Another course we do is on the fivefold ministry mm -hmm. because we believe that. Yes, that's good. Now, I work with a lot of single parents. And if they just say, oh, I'm a single parent, I'm bringing up my three kids or whatever it is. I say, but you're one of the people that Acts 2 verse 17 talked about. Mm. You're one of the young women that God has poured his spirit onto. Yes. And suddenly they go, 
did he know he was going to be a single <laughs> parent? I said, of course he did. Yes. He knew everything about you. And then they go, oh, so he can use me. I yes. said, yes. You're not going to be like a prophet in the Old <laughs> Testament, either bald or with a great long beard and wrinkles and all of that, and a man. <laughs> you are going to be an end times prophet. Yes. Because yes. that's what yes. God says. Right. And I believe and I take God at his word. Yes. And he's certainly never let me down, so he... <laughs> That's uh, great. Well, I look forward to um, you know, viewing the programmes and the teachings that you'll be sharing with us. And um, thank you for um, coming today and sharing your experiences and your ministry that the Lord's called you into. And um, yeah, it's, been, um, it's been good to meet you today and talk about these things. Well, it's a privilege. You're part of the young people that God has <laughs> talked about. And our little strap line really now is, this is the time and you are the people. Yes. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Jesus is coming back and I thought well I knew about Christmas I knew about <laughs> Easter I had never heard that Jesus was coming wow. back oh, yeah, yeah that's right yeah. that's right and to unpack I mean the Bible contains every single truth it is our manual for living and that's again why we called it Academy for Life but people need to know how to apply it yes. you know everything about you and then they go oh so he can use me I yes. said yes you're not going to be like a prophet in the Old Testament, either bald or with a great long beard and wrinkles and all of that, and a man. You are going to be an end times prophet. Yes. Because that's what God says.